morning. God is on his throne and he's calling us again into his presence this morning for worship. I thought we'd begin our time a little differently than we have the last couple of weeks uh, since all of this has become our temporary normal. And uh, I want to stress that word temporary. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to recite to you the beginning of the book of James. This is the apostle speaking to some of the early Christians. And, and what I want to do is I want to stand in the place of James. And I want to ask all of you uh, to stand in the place of those early believers and, and to really listen to the things that I'm saying and try to receive them for yourselves personally and, and maybe like you're hearing them for the first time. Before we do that, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I ask this morning that you would look upon your church, your people whom you love and whom I love. And I pray that you would bless them and that you would enable them by your Holy Spirit to receive the words that I'm about to speak as living encouragement. Father, may it be that to them this morning and may that word remain and abide in them in all the days ahead that uh, will reflect this morning and be like this morning. Uh, Father, we are admittedly disheartened and, uh, and we long for the day that we can be together once again. Uh, but Lord, at the same time, we take great comfort in knowing that you know the end from the beginning and you have counted those days already. So we surrender them all to you. And Father, I ask that you would do these things for your glory and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Nathan, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the faithful of the Flushing Alliance Church, dispersed abroad. Greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the trying of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Amen. We're continuing on in our series in the Gospel of John this morning, and very rapidly approaching the end of the book. Um, I am going to be bringing a Good Friday message, so look for that in our lead into Resurrection Sunday. And the week after, on April 19th, we'll be finishing our series, the Lord willing, and I'll be bringing what is actually the 50th message in this series in our gospel, if you can believe it. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, I want to welcome you on behalf of the Briefly Scattered Church, and I also want to extend to you my personal invitation that you join together with us when we gather once more here on High Street and all of this is finished to worship together. We would love to have you. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 18. Uh, we are going to be picking up right where we left off last week at verse 28. That is John 18 beginning with verse 28. I want to ask that wherever you are, if you're able to do it, that you please stand with me in reverence to what God has spoken. This is the Word of God. These are the words of God given to the Apostle John by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we ought to receive them as such. So hear now the words of the living and the true God. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the Praetorium, and it was early. And they themselves did not enter into the praetorium, so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death, to fulfill the word of Jesus which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. 
Therefore Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you wish then that I release for you the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for your word. And we ask now that in this hour you would apply it to our hearts for righteousness' sake. God, move among your people by your Holy Spirit, who even now testifies with our spirits that we're your children. May we see Christ more clearly this morning, more gloriously this morning, and may we see him more hopefully this morning. Grant us these things, we pray, in his name. Amen. You may be seated. So look at verse 28. It's early. Remember the rooster crow. That was more than just an omen of Peter's denial. That also meant that it was morning. Imagine Pilate, this Judean governor, for a minute, with all of these Jews gathering outside with an argument over their religion. And on top of that, they won't even come in to see him because it's a holiday of theirs and they won't bother being defiled. And so he's actually got to go out to them. You can almost uh, sense the, the tension that's building around all of this. And never mind, by the way, that there's no prohibition in the Old Testament that would, uh, that would stop them from entering in. This is just something that they had uh, conjured up in their own traditions. And the supreme irony of all of this, of course, was that they weren't hesitating to condemn a man to die, but wouldn't be caught dead being ceremonially defiled because, you know, we've got to celebrate the Passover. That's pretty important. Murder's one thing, but ritual defilement? No. No, we're, we're going to make sure that our hands are ceremonially clean as we deliver the Lamb of God over to the slaughter. If you ever read the scathing words that Jesus had for uh, the frauds and the Pharisees of his day, I, I think that verse 28 is all of that. Uh, vain religion, gross hypocrisy, blindness, deadness, self-indulgence. It's all of those things uh, pictured. It's all of those things kind of put together in this great visual. I think this really sums everything up. Uh, they go through all the motions, they'd observe all the rituals, but they do it with hearts that couldn't be further away from God. I'll tell you this, if they had gone into that building, they would have done more to defile that building than that building would have done to defile all of them. That's the truth of the matter, but they were more preoccupied with keeping their own invented law and while killing the one who came to fulfill the law of God, actually, to realize it. So Pilate asks what he's done, and they answer him with... Um, I don't know, it's sort of a mixture of cover-up. You can tell that they really don't want to get into the fact that this is a religious dispute. It's sort of a mixture of cover-up with underlying sarcasm, maybe. And so they answer him with, do you really think we would bring him to you if he hadn't done something awfully bad? Of course, Pilate's really not interested in all of their uh, holy wars, their religious drama, their, their debates over these things. And so he says in verse 31, you take him. You take him and judge him by your own law. In other words, I don't want anything to do with him. But there's one problem with that, as far as they're concerned, and they want the death penalty. They want to execute him, and they need Rome for that, or so they say. Now look at verse 32. This carries a lot more weight than you'd think it does at first glance. Verse 32 says that they said this, that we want to uh, execute him, that, that we're not allowed to execute him. They said this to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. And think about it. All along, Jesus has been saying what? That he's going to die how? By being lifted up. When the Jews wanted to carry out capital punishment, they stoned you. They threw you down. But when the Romans executed somebody, they nailed you to a cross and they lifted you up. And Jesus said to Nicodemus back in chapter 3, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. 
And you, maybe you're thinking, yeah, but did he mean that literally? Well, in John 12, 32, he said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. And he got a whole lot more specific in Mark chapter 10 when he said, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered to the high priest and the scribes and they will hand him over and they will condemn him to death and he'll be handed over to the Gentiles and they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And then after three days, he will rise again. And if that's still not specific enough, Jesus said in Matthew 26, 2, I'm going to be crucified. So he told them where he was going to die. He told them when he was going to die. He told them who was going to do it, and he told them how they were going to do it. This is not insignificant. Look at verse 31. I want you to understand this. Pilate gave them permission, okay? Pilate gave them permission. They could have taken Jesus, and they could have handled this in-house, so to speak, and they, and they could have gone and executed him themselves. Now, they say to Pilate that they're not permitted to carry out the death penalty, but if you turn over to Acts chapter 7, you'll see that that's really an argument that's made out of convenience when you see what they did to Stephen. Or John chapter 8, even, with the woman that's caught in adultery. They're ready to stone him, and they will, and they're about to stone her to death until Jesus disqualified them as executioners. So this whole, we can't kill him ourselves, that, that just doesn't hold up doesn't hold up. What they wanted out of all this was Roman complicity so that they could do what they already wanted to do before the crowds and have some kind of validation about it and sort of pass the buck and sort of pass the responsibility and the blame. By the way, some of them had already tried to kill him before, twice. They tried to stone him back in chapter 8 and they tried to do it again back in chapter 10, but he's not going to die by being pelted with rocks. He's going to die by being pierced with nails. And the reason for that is because, one, the scriptures say, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And the Apostle Paul is going to tell us that Christ became a curse for us. We'll return to that on Friday, Lord willing. And two, because the prophet Isaiah, written hundreds of years before the Persians invented crucifixion and hundreds of years before the Romans perfected crucifixion, told us that the Messiah would give his back to those who would strike him and would not cover his face from the humiliation and spitting and be marred more than any man, and that by his scorching we would be healed, and that he would be pierced for our transgressions. And the psalmist expands on that in a text that would have been a thousand years old at the time of Jesus' ministry and tells us that that piercing would be his hands and his feet. You see, if they'd just done it themselves, if they'd stoned him, Jesus' word would have proven false, and the scriptures themselves would have proven false. I know last week's message was my Jesus is still in control message, but if I'd wanted to, I could have named this week Jesus is still in control part two, and then I could have done a part three and a part four and a part five, because that's always true no matter where we're looking, whether it's in the scriptures or whether it's in the world around us, amen? He's always in control. He has all authority. In fact, if there's any governor like the Roman one we're reading about here, or any of the 50 others that are giving daily news conferences, or there's a high priest, or there's a Jewish court, or there's an invisible virus, or there's a dust moat that's outside of his sovereign control, then you can't have the slightest confidence in any promise that God has ever made about the future. You just can't. Now, that's not a problem for us. I just wanted to point that out here. The, the Word of God leaves us with no doubts about the authority of Christ in all things. Now, while the pundits and the politicians and the pandemics fool the rest of the world into thinking that nobody's in control and that nothing is certain, we know, we know as believers that Jesus Christ is working all things out for his glory and for the good of his people. And that extends even to the events right now that are unfolding all around us. And so we have confidence as we look out at a panicking world, the events that are unfolding in this text. And the events that have unfolded since the garden, they look like a witch hunt, and it looks like a miscarriage of justice. And of course, that's what it is from a human standpoint. This entire trial is a tragedy, and the crucifixion will be the greatest crime ever committed by men. But from the divine perspective, from God's perspective, it is both providential and it is prophetic. God is using powerful men some of the most powerful men of that day, to carry out his will perfectly. And that ought to give us confidence this morning as believers. Nothing dethrones the king. Every inclination of his purpose will stand, though every power of hell and earth come against him. Every purpose for your life that belongs to him will stand. And his word says that his purposes for you are good, that he is for you. 
if you belong to him. But can you trust him for the promises if it means trusting him for the nails? Can you trust that he's working out through circumstances that you can't understand right now what is best for you? I'll tell you this, if we would be less concerned, if all of us would be less concerned with trying to figure out what God is doing and, and instead just remind ourselves of who God is, we'd ask far fewer questions and we'd have far fewer doubts and we would have a far greater peace. I, I want to encourage you this morning to let the trial of Jesus speak to your trials right now. Because the end of the story for the believer is always, always, always glorious, even if the immediate isn't. And, and just when you think that someone else is writing that story, he flips the script. Look at how he begins to do it here. Pilate summons Jesus for questioning. He doesn't waste any time with the small talk. He cuts right to the chase. Are you the king of the Jews? I, I love that this text landed on Palm Sunday. I think it's just wildly appropriate. We think back to the crowds and the people spreading out branches and spreading out their coats on the road before him and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And before, when the, the Pharisees objected to all of that and they asked Jesus, rebuke them, rebuke these crowds, their implication, of course, being that he wasn't a king, he said, if these become silent, the rocks will cry out. Which, if you look carefully, that's not him saying that he is the king. But that's not him saying that he's not the king either. He's not denying it. But now the question comes directly. Are you the king that they say you are? Verse 34, Jesus answers, and I love this. Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? And you listen to that and you ask yourself the question, who's the interrogator now? Who's asking the questions now? We might find Pilate acting as the judge, and we'll see him sitting on the judgment seat in the next chapter, but it is him who is right now standing before the judge of all the earth. One day, this will be you. I don't mean you in a faceless crowd before a faraway Christ. I mean you in the king's court giving an account. This will be you. Pilate stood there once, and he's going to stand there again on that day. But it won't be before the suffering servant of Isaiah. It'll be before the dreadful judge of Revelation from whose presence earth and heaven will flee. And the terrifying words that follow is that no place will be found for them. Meaning that there's no failure to appear before that court. There's no getting away from that judge. There's no bargain. There's no plea agreement. It's just you. In him, And you'll either be standing before him clothed in his righteousness and under the blood, or you'll be standing before him clothed in shame and under his wrath. Pilate says, am I a Jew? In other words, do you think I'm the one bringing this up? They're the ones that brought you in. Your nation and your priests have delivered you to me. So why are you here? What have you done? I don't really have any interest in any of this. I, I just want to know why they want you dead. I just want to know why you're taking up my time. And Jesus answered, my kingdom, my kingdom is not of this world. Now he admits that he's a king because if you've got a kingdom, that makes you a king. But then he qualifies it. If my kingdom were of this world and my servants would be fighting, my kingdom is not of this realm. Now he's demonstrated what he's saying here. Remember last week, remember in the garden when Peter wanted to fight and Jesus told him to put the sword away because that's not how my kingdom works. That's never been how my kingdom works. It's never going to be how it works. Now he's not saying in this that his dominion doesn't include this world or that it doesn't extend to this realm because it does. This is the same Jesus who will go on to say that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. This is the same Jesus of whom the angel speaks in Revelation eleven fifteen 15, when he declares the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and his Christ, and he will reign forevermore. But it's not a rebellion against Rome, and it's not a political revolution, and it's not a violent uprising because it doesn't need to be. And in fact, it's never going to be a kingdom over which the advancing is going to be done through fleshly means. It doesn't have to be. In other words, he says, my kingdom isn't like your kingdom. 
or any other kingdom that's ever been. It's not built on the rattling of swords. It's built on beating them into plowshares. It's not built on the coercion of the outer man. It's built on the conversion of the inner man. It is built on bloodshed, yes, but it's built on my blood being shed for them and not the other way around. Never the other way around. But Pilate disregards every bit of the spiritual substance of Jesus' words and his only response to that, his only response to hearing every single thing that Jesus has said is, so you are a king. He just hears an admission. Now look at Jesus' answer because he's admitting to being a little more than a king here. Look carefully at this. You say correctly that I am a king. So he gets that right out of the way, but it's what he says next that's incredible. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into this world. Now, he's not saying the same thing there twice. The purpose is the same in both cases. In other words, the reason that he was born and the reason that he came, the reasons are the same, but he's not saying the same thing twice. Being born and coming into this world aren't the same thing. He was born in Bethlehem. That's Jesus' humanity. But came into the world necessarily refers to something that came before Bethlehem. This is Jesus' divinity. If he came somewhere, that means he came from somewhere else. This is the pre-existence. This is what he meant in chapter 8 when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. This is Isaiah 9, 6. A child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. I was born and I came. And the purpose of both the coming and his being born is this. To testify to the truth. To make plain the truth of God. And Pilate, with all the skepticism and the cynicism and the dismissal of some 21st century woke individual, says, what is truth? He sounds like he fit right in today, where you have your truth and I have my truth and both of those truths are valid, even if they're the polar opposite of each other, even if they don't even comport with reality. We're given uh, up the objective. In this world, we've given that up and we've replaced it with, how do you feel about that? We're not worried about facts. We're not worried about what genuine, subjective, uh, real truth is. It's just, how do you feel about that? How does that make you feel? Oxford Dictionaries always chooses a word of the year, and it's supposed to be something that reflects the mood or the preoccupation of the day. Last year, it was climate emergency, which, you know, I'm no mathematician, but I'm pretty sure that's actually two words. In 2016, the word of the year was post-truth. Post-truth. Now, that's hyphenated. So I guess that, that counts as one word. They didn't hyphenate the other one. Anyway, post-truth. And they defined it as relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential than appeals to emotion and personal belief. Now, that's of course nonsense, but it's real nonsense and it's running rampant because the truth gets uncomfortable when you exchange it for a lie and that defines all the world outside of Jesus. Meanwhile, Jesus says, listen to this, I came to testify to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. There isn't a person in this world, nor has there ever been, who knows the truth, who rejects Christ. If you reject him, you don't know the truth because he is the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears his voice. Well, Pilate didn't hear him. Because he didn't, he didn't listen to him. He didn't listen to a word he was saying. But he didn't find any fault in him either. Because there was no fault in him. And if you think about it, since Christ is the Passover lamb and the sacrifice is to be without blemish or spot, then what we have here is actually one more objective testimony that he is just that, from an unlikely source in a very indirect way. Pilate examines the Lord Jesus and he gives this unbiased verdict. No fault. No sin. And if it had stopped there, then those words could never have been said about any of us. I want to close today with what I believe is a parable about what's about to happen, delivered us 
delivered to us in this, this small, almost anecdotal incident that occupies just two verses of John's Gospel. Now this is a historical book, these are historical uh, details, but I think there's something more to it. Understand that Pilate's relationship with the Jews was already a tumultuous one. Just go ahead and forget for a moment everything you know about modern politics. You want to talk about a scandalous administration? You want to talk about rock bottom approval ratings? You want to talk about an unpopular official? History tells us that Pontius Pilate funded a public works project by seizing the treasure of their temple. A, a riot broke out after that. He had a bunch of them clubbed to death, which obviously didn't remedy the relationship. And if those missteps weren't enough, he actually went on to, to decorate Jerusalem with idols, and he, he struck coins with pagan images on them. It was one outrage after another, and it fueled protests, and it fueled unrest, and it brought the city on more than one occasion to a boiling point. He had one job as the governor of Judea, and it was to keep the Jews there calm. It was to keep them in line, and he was pretty terrible at it. In fact, at one point, he even managed to provoke the four sons of Herod, and they wrote a letter to Caesar that landed him with a pretty unamused order to stop instigating the people. And now he was facing another situation that was potentially explosive. He had interrogated Jesus, and he had found no fault in him. But if the crowds outside were adamant that Jesus be killed, then he might be facing another riot. And with the record he already had, that kind of thing could be catastrophic. Especially if word got back to Rome, it would probably mean his career. But there was a tradition. There was a tradition where every year at the Passover, the governor would release a prisoner. And so enters Barabbas. And Matthew's Gospel describes Pilate as offering the people a choice between the two, Barabbas and Jesus. There's an old saying in the gambling world that there's no such thing as a sure thing. You probably saw this as an opportunity to let Jesus go without being blamed for it, because when he presents the two options, it seems pretty obvious that he tried to pick the sure thing. And he was probably thinking, there's no way that they're going to choose this guy over Jesus. John tells us that Barabbas was a robber, but the other Gospels tell us that he was also a murderer and an insurrectionist. Matthew calls him a notorious prisoner. Jesus, on the other hand, he was manifestly innocent. He was obviously innocent. Now, the chief priests and the scribes, they would have had nothing but disdain for Barabbas or any other terrorist. We need to understand that. There's no chance whatsoever that they would have approved of, let alone requested, that Barabbas actually be released at any point in time. But then here stands Jesus, and their hostility toward him outweighs even their contempt for Barabbas. And so the unthinkable unfolds. It's been said that before people hang, the night before, they begin involuntarily rubbing their necks. It's been said that on the eve of dying in a gas chamber, people will start holding their breath, seeing how long they can hold their breath, seeing how much they can, they can keep that oxygen in. Do you suppose that someone who was going to be crucified might start rubbing their feet and rubbing their wrists and maybe the night before stretching out their arms taking those deep breaths. I want you to imagine that you're Barabbas for a moment. In some dungeon, with your crimes being exactly as the Bible describes them, meaning that there's no mystery about what lies ahead of you. Rome doesn't tolerate insurrectionists. You know what's coming. There's no appeal. There's no bargaining. There's just you and four walls and waiting to be scourged and humiliated and waiting for the nails. And maybe you're taking those deep breaths and maybe you're stretching out your arms and not anticipation, but fear of what's ahead of you. You know what's coming and there's no getting around it. And then the day arrives. The day we've been reading about here. Maybe you heard that rooster that Peter heard, and that was the first time you woke up and you dozed back off, and, and now it's the clamoring outside in that courtyard that wakes you up again. It's all that commotion, and you hear the shouts, crucify him, crucify him. And you think, well, today's it. It must be today. This is it. And all of a sudden, you hear the jailer's keys as he's coming down the hall. 
and he's getting closer and closer and he opens the door and the light floods in and he grabs you and he starts dragging you out toward that increasingly restless crowd and you see them all. You see everyone spread out around you, their faces, their shouts, all of this commotion. And just as you think that you are about to endure the first of many beatings that day and suffer the insults of this sea of people who's obviously just come to watch you die, suddenly the, grab, the guard, he grabs your arms and he starts unlocking your shackles. And they fall to the ground and he pushes you into that horde of people. Some of them are congratulating you and they're patting you on the back. And suddenly you realize in that moment that you're, you're free. And as you look over your shoulder, you see another man on the platform and the chanting hasn't stopped. They're all still demanding a crucifixion, but it's not for you, it's for him. And they're starting to drag him away now, and, and you don't recognize him to look at him. You don't know who this is, but you hear the whispers in the crowd, and then you know exactly who this is, because who hasn't heard of Jesus of Nazareth? He's the one that said, blessed are the poor and the peacemakers. He's the one that would stay up all night healing the sick. He, he fed people. He delivered people. He opened blind eyes. He cleansed the lepers. He made lame men to walk again. And wait a minute, why is he up there? What's going on? What is this? And as you're carted along with a throng of spectators watching as the events of the day unfold, you begin to realize exactly what this is and what's happening as Jesus is slapped across the face time and again and stripped of his clothes and of his dignity and beaten until the flesh from his back hangs off of him like ribbons. And, and you're watching as he carries that heavy wooden beam on his shoulders through the city. He's half fainting and he's bleeding out and, and you realize as, as he's lifted up on this cross and he's stapled to it with these primitive nails and he's, he's lifted up by these two men that you recognize, your two co-conspirators from the insurrection, you realize that that's your cross. That's your cross. And Jesus, who is always in control, took it from you. Willingly. He took your guilt and he took your shame and he took your consequences and your curse. He took your disgrace. He took your death and he set you free. He let you go free. The word says God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might be the righteousness of God in him. I know I told you to imagine that you were Barabbas, but the truth is when the holiness of God is the measuring stick, the difference between you and me and Barabbas, it gets lost somewhere in the round. End. We're all the same on our sinful merits. We're in the same spiritual prison. We're under the same condemnation. By nature, we're rebels, every one of us. We're the insurrectionists. Not against Rome, but against the rule and reign of God whose law we've broken and disregarded and substituted with our own. The story of Barabbas shows us the beginning of the great exchange that's about to take place where Christ will willingly embrace the cross and gladly bear the iniquities of his people. And all who will believe in his person and in his words and in his resurrection by faith will receive his righteousness. The Son of God died that sinners might live. They chose the wrong man that day. But God put forward the right one, and it wasn't a gamble. It was grace. We were Barabbas. And Jesus is our substitute. And God add his blessing to the preaching of his word. Father, how dreadful, but how wonderful it all is. Give us clarity, God, in the face of this. 
about our own lives, about our own sin and our own hearts as we look more and more to the one who gave his life for ours. I ask, Lord, that you would bless your church in this moment and in the days ahead as we find ourselves at a distance from one another. May the nearness of your love for us in Christ bind us closer in this season than ever we've been and show us, Father, and our eventual glad reunion, a taste of that greater reunion that we've longed for all these days with all the saints and with our Savior, who with his own blood has set us free. And bless all those who add their amens to mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, I want you to receive this benediction wherever you are this morning. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even so, may he come quickly.